Thank you so much, Trisha, for inviting me. Oh, now, where are we? There we go. Okay, so um, I was going to start off and say exactly what Trisha has just said, but now I don't need to. Um, throughout the talk, please feel free to ask questions. Um, and when you ask a question, if I don't repeat it, you have to wave your hands violently at me until I do repeat it, because otherwise the recording won't hear your question and it will be, even though I have the best of intentions, you always start the talk with the best of intentions and then immediately forget to repeat the question as soon as anyone asks you it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about generally kind of the app search problem. Um, I'm going to start off by kind of talking about why apps are important and, and why app search is important. Um, then talk a little bit about why app search is a difficult problem because, hey, we've got some pretty good search engines out there, so why is this not a solved problem already? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've solved it at Chomp, uh, then what that means, how are we actually doing, and, and what we're going to do in the future. So uh, this may or may not be sort of just a given to everyone, but apps are pretty important. Uh, this is a slide from Mary Meeker's 2010 presentation where she kind of talks about, you know, web trends and global trends. Um, and uh, essentially what it's saying is that the mobile internet is growing eight times faster than the, the fixed internet was, than any other sort of uh, walled ga garden mobile internet has grown in the, pr in the past. And this is a pretty big deal. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that this is not sort of driven by browsers. So there have been many, many, many solutions that carriers, and I used to be at a carrier and we rolled several of these out, solutions like WAP, solutions like XHTML, walled gardens, um, the carrier deck with the 50 approved mobile websites that you could go to. Um, Things like iMode, which was very popular in Japan and was absolutely disastrous in Australia. <laughs> um, and uh, really what has changed all of this is kind of two things. Firstly, people finally have an easy way of using this, this mobile, this connected appliance on their phone. So the iPhone's pretty user-friendly, Android's pretty good. You don't need to be typing in long URLs um, with your little mobile keyboard, you just pr click on an app and da-da, it appears. But the other thing is that actually the way that you find these applications has changed. The web is fundamentally a pretty bad place for finding new stuff. Um, it's kind of easy if you have a p specific fact that you're looking for. If you want to know when Napoleon died, you can type in when Napoleon died and find a whole bunch of, of uh, websites that will tell you that. But it doesn't necessarily tell you you know, if you type in, say, I'm bored, it doesn't necessarily give you fun things to do, right? Um, and so this app, these, the creations of these app stores actually allowed for distribution for these mobile apps in a, in a way that hadn't previously been possible. And so just a few stats. Um, there's around about a million mobile apps across iPhone, Android, iPad, um, and some of the smaller stores. Um, there's more apps than there were websites in 1996, and it's growing faster. The number of apps is growing faster than the number of websites were in 1996. Um, and some analysts have estimated that there's going to be 44 billion app downloads by 2016, which is pretty as astronomical. Um, and one thing before I just go on any further, I want to say that any time that I use the word app tonight, I'm not talking necessarily about an iPhone app. I'm not talking necessarily even about a native app. What I'm talking about is the UI of an app. So the fact that um, some, a piece of functionality is wrapped up in one little convenient package and then installed somewhere that people can click on. So you know, I, we're pretty agnostic to the native app versus web app debate. You know, if, if web apps win, we think that's, that's great because I'd quite frankly much rather build things in a browser than I would in Objective-C. But, um, but right now, we, we don't think that that's going to happen in the short term. But uh, the point is that we're not kind of strictly defining what an app is here. So why is app search important? So I don't know if you guys remember this, but this is Yahoo's homepage from the late 90s. And I remember when I first 
went here, and I was like, oh my god, what is this internet thing? And I clicked around, and I've always been really into cooking. And I remember like clicking through, I don't know, I think it was entertainment, and then you got into food, and then you got into cooking, and there were like five recipe websites on the entire internet. And I was like, oh my god, this is the most amazing thing ever. I would never do that now, obviously. And what's interesting is that even Google, as late as 2001, had this Google web directory, the web organized by topic, on their homepage, and then a similar directory. And it's because back in the early days of the internet, nobody knew what websites were out there. You weren't guaranteed that a website would exist. There was no one, you know, if I was interested in Cajun cooking, there was no guarantee that there'd even be in a website that talked about Cajun cooking. Um, and uh, we were still kind of working out what this whole thing was. And so the, the ability to browse and sort of look around and be like, oh my God, there's an entire website dedicated to J.R.R. Tolkien. This is amazing. These are the kind of revelations I had when <laughs> I first played with the internet. Um, and we're seeing, and so th eventually there was a tipping point though. And what's interesting is that the exact same thing is happening with apps. And this, this tipping point is kind of characterized by, on the one hand, you sort of go from, what content is out there? I don't know what apps even exist. And, oh, I need to kind of learn what apps are out there, or I needed to learn what websites were out there, to, of course, there's a, a website for that. I just need to type it into Google, and it needs to help me find it, because now there are way too many websites. There's way too many websites about Cajun cooking. And so I just want to know how I can get there as quickly as possible. Um, and so, this kind of paradigm here is, is this shift that happens in any collection of content, this shift from browse to search. And we believe that we're in the middle of that kind of shift right now with apps. So let's say that the answer is search, right? Let's say I've convinced you of that. So the question now is, well, why is this actually a difficult problem? There are some pretty damn good search out engines out there, right? You find what you need on Google, and you know, search is a solved problem. It's a, it's a, you know, there's a very mature information retrieval community. Um, why, why can't we just do it? And so now I'm going to go into about, I don't know, 10 slides where I talk about why web search and app search are different. So uh, the first reason is that there's actually fundamentally different user experiences and user intentions when, they, when a user comes to an app search box as opposed to a web search box. So on the left here, these are some, well, the top four are some top queries um, from a corpus of web query data. The bottom one is just a more tail query that I put in for effect. Um, and the, the, bo the image at the bottom is obviously Google results. And on the right, these are some popular app search queries and some Trump results. Now, what's interesting is that web search really evolved out of libraries, right? This is, you know, the, the field of information retrieval was a field that was in li librarians, library and information sciences. Um, and it really it has evolved out of this fundamental kind of information search need, right? So if you type uh, best uh, moisturizer, into Google, you're not necessarily going to find great results. But if you, find, if you type, when did Napoleon die? Or you type the particular error code for some bug that something's given you, you're going to find some pretty good results. And it's because this kind of uh, this search paradigm has really evolved around these kind of keyword matching information seeking needs. And so that's why when you do a search for social networking on Google, you don't see Facebook, even though it's the biggest social networking site in the world. You don't see Twitter. You see the Wikipedia page for social networking. Because the Wikipedia page for social networking has the phrase social networking repeated a bazillion times through it, whereas Facebook doesn't even have the word social network on its homepage. For Trump, however, and for app search in general, actually, it's, it's the reverse of this. When users type social networking into Trump, they don't want to see an app that's a reference app that talks about social networking as a subject. They want to see apps that are social networking apps. When they type in puzzle games, they want to see apps that are puzzle games. And so there's kind of this, 
it's hard to quantify, but there's this almost this more semantic nature to the types of queries that people type into app search box, um, which is kind of interesting. And so this is um, a graph of Chomps traffic um, that's been annotated. So we've, we've taken a, a random sample of query traffic, and we've annotated it based on um, what, whether it fits into the following sort of groups. And you can see that there's, you know, there's, a, there's a bunch of kind of navigational queries, which is, you've told me Angry Birds is an amazing game, and I should go and download it. So I type Angry Birds into the box. And people do that pretty frequently. Um, people also do these kind of pretty browsy queries, so things like free apps. It's pretty popular on Chomp. Um, people like free apps. Who knew? Um, there's also some kind of niche things. People type in developer names. You type in Electronic Arts, as an example, to find some great EA games. Um, people type in things like games for girls because they're looking for a user group or San Francisco, but really the main thing that they type in are these functional queries. They type in to-do lists, or they type in metronome, or they type in tip calculator, or they type in, express tr in expense tracker, etc. But what's interesting is because it's mobile, they don't type very much. So the average length of a web search query is three words. The average length of an app search query is one and a half words, which is really, really, really bad if you're a search engine because you want them to put in more words so that they can express more intention. If you've only got one and a half words to go on, if it, let's say somebody puts in the query photo, right? You know, there's a lot of really good apps that have something to do with photo, right? What you really want is you want them to put in photo editing or filter camera or you know, something like that that's a little more specific, has a few more words. And so uh, you kind of have to do some pretty crazy things to actually encourage users to enter in more queries, which you don't have to do on the web because you've got a keyboard and you just go nuts. So there's kind of this, uh, there's kind of this first problem, which is that just the user, when the user comes to an app search box, they have a different intent to when they come to a, a web search box. The second problem is data availability. So what data do we have to search over? What we have is we, we have the app name, we have the app description, we have some other stuff that's pretty minor with things like the app categories or the developer name or things like that. But fundamentally, it's not very much information. Compared to web search, we have the entire website that you, you know, you have all the metadata and you can like go and crawl every word that's on the site, right? And so these, the, so when I talk about a document, I'm talking about this kind of amalgamation of the name and the description and et cetera. And uh, the problem is that A, the documents are very short compared to a, a web page. Um, they're generally not written with SEO in mind. Um, they, you know, they say things like, we have five stars on Gizmodo, right? And suddenly you've got this search problem where this app is showing up for Gizmodo, the query, even though it's got nothing to do with Gizmodo, it just happens to, to have a review from them. Or they'll say things like, if there are any bugs, uh, please email the developer here. Don't give us a one-star review. Or we fix this bug. Don't give us a one-star review. And the problem is that these app descriptions are kind of used for multiple different purposes. They're, they're used to sell the, the um, user on what the app is, but they're also used to tell the user how great the app is or communicate with the user about new updates or problems or how they're going to fix something or, oh, don't forget you need to do an in-app purchase. And so there's a big, the way that we, we refer to that is that there's this big difference between the query language and the document language. So the query language is kind of very specific and it has these very functional keywords, but the document language doesn't necessarily just talk about the same functional, the same functional words. So let's go through an example. Can you guys see that okay? Is, this, is the, this is the iTunes page for an app called Camera Plus. So we think that the Camera Plus is a pretty good result for the query photo editing. So let's see how much the words photo editing are actually used in this app description. And this is truncated, by the way. It keeps on going, and there are no more matches down here. So there's a heap of words, and it talks about all the features that this app has. It says things like no more blurry shots, and crops let you fra frame your pick perfectly, and touch exposure and focus. 
But, and it has the word photos. Well, it has the word photo once. It has a kind of a, you could, if you do some crazy stuff around stemming or lemmatization, you can get the word photos quite a few times. But the words edit and editing don't appear, which is pretty crazy, really. However, contrast that to the Google search results for photo editing, or photo editor. And there's a hell of a lot of word matches. And this is just in the snippet text. You imagine how many then these word matches, how many more these times this phrase would match if you actually went into the, the uh, text of the site. This is, how, this is how web search has evolved, word matches like this. And so you don't see Photoshop as a result for photo editing. I actually did this query again this morning to check. I put this slide together a couple of weeks ago. And Adobe has bought the query photo editing. And so now that appears as a sponsored uh, app up the top. But um, because why? I mean, it's ridiculous. They're the best photo editor in the world. I don't know why they're not showing up. But um, you know, instead, you have free online photo editor.com. And this is SEO. And this is, this is part of the problem why you don't necessarily find stuff that you want when you Google. So recall is a big problem. Now, let me, this is kind of a complicated graph, so bear with me. One of my researchers made this, and she likes to overcomplicate things, but she's great. Um, so this is iPhone, and this is Android. And what we did was we took a bunch of queries, and we worked out what are the gold standard apps that we would definitely, definitely want to appear in the recall set for those queries. And so this is, you know, so we have this, this little experimental framework. And what we went through and looked at was this bar is the app description. How many times did, how many of those gold standard apps actually had the query phrase in the app description? And you can see it's pretty low, actually. This is the exact phrase. And this is if you, like, look at the unigrams broken up and kind of munched around with stemming and lemmatization. And so, if you're looking for the exact phrase, it's pretty bad. If you are willing to be a bit lenient, then that obviously way blows out your recall set, but you, you do find a few more things. We then went and looked and said, well, maybe we just don't have enough data here. Maybe our documents need to be longer. And so we went and looked at a whole bunch of app review sites around the, the internet. So app review sites, they should be really good sources of this data, right? They should be saying things like, Adobe Photoshop is a great photo editor. But in fact, it's even worse than the app descriptions. These are the red bars. And then we looked at, well, maybe these two combined, maybe they just happen to like, provide the mutually exclusive proof that you need to you know, uh, be able to solve the problem fully. And in fact, you can't. So this, these purple bars are if you combine them. There's still a pretty big gap that, with apps that just don't have the query words anywhere in the data that you have. And so this is kind of the opposite problem on the web, right? The web, web search has always kind of been built out of this assumption that the recall set doesn't matter. You want the recall set to just be huge. You just want all of the apps, uh, sorry, all of the websites that even possibly have any mentions of the query word in them. And then you rank really intelligently. So pr precision in the ranking is very, very important. Um, but doesn't matter what's on page 100, because who's ever going to click through to page 100, right? For us, we have problems just getting matching to happen. This is, a, this is one of our biggest challenges. So what this means is that TFIDF, which is the, the core of web search, doesn't really work for app search. And I had somebody ask me just before the talk, well, why don't we just use ontologies? Why don't you just have app reviewers go through and review each app and tag each app? And what's interesting is that that's actually kind of what Yahoo did when web search started taking off, right? Yahoo had these warehouses of editors who would go through and say, oh, the query photo editor should have these websites as results. And they went through and, and tagged. And, and this kind of worked for a little while, right? But then. It stopped working because suddenly the scale just blew out and, and it's impossible to kind of go through and, and construct an ontology for the internet. This kind of works for companies like Amazon or Netflix that have some pretty structured content. 
So Amazon, you can kind of go through and say, oh, books have these genres, and then you know, you've got fiction and nonfiction, and then you can go through and say, well, you've got your science fiction and your fantasy and you know, your romance novels and blah, 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 blah. And it's pretty, pretty structured. But when you're talking about the internet and you have new apps coming along every day that do just crazy new things, that how do you fit them into the ontology? Like, it's, it's, it's just not, you know, it's the, it's the reason that Yahoo didn't succeed, right? Because they had this, this ontology and they invested so heavily in this ontology and it, and it just failed. And so it's been kind of at the core of Trump's technology strategy to never, ever, ever be dependent on ontologies or human tagging. And so everything we do is algorithmic, and it's been very important to us to find a solution that even though there's only a million apps out there right now, which is pretty small scale on, on search, for search standards, that we want to be able to do everything that we do right now, we want to be able to do when there are a billion apps. And so, um, so that's, that's problem two, is, is the data. Uh, problem three is structural, and this is really just a a footnote, really. But fundamentally, apps don't have a link structure. And so a lot of the, the, uh, the ways that web search get ar gets around some of the problems that I talked about earlier, things like maybe the, the document language being slightly different, is that they use anchor text. And so anchor text is, if on my blog, Kathy's blog, which doesn't exist, but if it did, Kathy's blog, I say, I'm doing a talk at the um, ACM data mining SIG, and I link to the ACM homepage then that text that has the link, that's the anchor text. And even though that's on my page, it gets associated with the ACM's website as part of their metadata. And so what that is, is essentially like this crowdsourced description of what the web page is. And in some cases, it can be incredibly powerful. You know, as an example, Kathy's blog probably doesn't have Kathy's blog, the phrase written over and over and over throughout my blog, because that's probably a bit vain. But if lots of people linked to my blog and said Kathy's blog in the anchor text, then that would be a very strong signal. Unfortunately, we don't have links. Um, it also means, and this is kind of a bit of an aside, but it also means we can't do page rank. Um, page rank is not a content signal, and a lot of the problems we have with apps are actually content signals. Um, it's an authority signal. It's basically not how relevant is, is this website to this query, it's just how good is this website, how much can we trust this website overall. And we have kind of other signals that can make up for that. We, we actually have explicit user reviews, um, which is incredibly helpful. You know, there's, there's nobody out there reviewing all of the pages on the internet. So, um, so that's helpful. Um, but the less, lock, lack of anchor text is a huge problem. So how do we solve this? And we haven't solved it fully, because search is really, really, really hard, and Google haven't fully solved web search, and they've been going at it for a long time now. Um, but we like to think that we're on the way. Um, and basically, the way that we, we think of it is that we're bringing together machine learning and information retrieval in a way that kind of hasn't really been done as much before. Um, previously, these fields have actually been kind of separate. We have actually at Trump, we have a couple of advisors, um, academic advisors. One is a guy named Dr. David Bly, who's um, at Princeton, who um, is a machine learning expert in topic modeling. And we have another guy who's uh, by the name of Dr. Don Metzler, who's an information retrieval guru. Um, he literally wrote the book on information retrieval. Um, and neither of them had ever heard of each other before. <laughs> before becoming advisors to Trump. I mean, they, you know, vaguely, but, you know, they don't, go, people don't go to the same conferences. You know, there's not a lot of mixing in the two fields. And so we really wanted to, we really felt that we had to change that because if the content problems we were seeing, we knew had an information, a machine learning solution. And so just to be clear, the, the rest of the talk, I'm solving the search problem. There's a hell of a lot of problems that, that, uh, we have to solve. And I'm specifically going to be talking about one of the ones that we solved using machine learning specifically. There's a bunch of other complex things to our tech, but um, this is just one thing. So let me kind of show you the intuition behind this idea. So we knew in Camera Plus that there are only a few mentions of the word photo editing, right? But if you look at the description, there's a lot of words that kind of are 
topical to photo editing, right? There's words like exposure and focus and flash and blurry and zoom and crop and words that, you know, a, a human being could look at those words and say, yeah, they're kind of photo editing type words, right? And so we were like, there's something here. How can we actually capture this? How can we, even though these words aren't the, word, the literal string edit, how can we actually allow these to give some kind of weight to matching with the query? And so uh, we, I did a bunch of reading. And uh, this, this topic modeling algorithm called latent Dirichlet allocation came to the, you know, just really jumped out at me. And so I'm not going to do a very amazing job at explaining exactly what LDA is, but just at a very high level. LDA is a, a machine learning algorithm. It is unsupervised, so you give it some data and some stuff comes out the end and you don't need to give it any training data. Um, and it's a, it's a bag of words model. So basically what you do is you say, here are some documents, algorithm. And the algorithm says, uh, comes out with, and you say, here are some documents, and here is the number of topics that we expect to be in this document set. And what is produced is for each topic, for each one of those topics, it produces a list of words that, are, that kind of statistically co-occur for that topic. And then for each document, it produces what topics make up that document. And so the intuition behind, it's a generative model, and the intuition behind it is, if you imagine that when a human writes a document, they go through this process of, imagine you have two bags, and one bag is full of tokens that are colored different colors depending on the different topics that are in the world. And then the, you have a bag for each color of token, and each, um, each subsequent colored bag has the distribution of words in that topic. Then when you write your document, you say, I'm going to pull, a, uh, I'm going to say that this first word is going to be topic blue, and then you're going to go to the blue bag, and you're going to pull out a word and say, okay, the word is this, photo, as an example. And then I'm going to go back to my bag, and I'm going to say, okay, now the next word is going to be also a blue, and then pull a word out of the blue bag, and it's going to be editing, and then maybe the next, the next token is red, and so on and so forth. And so uh, the, the big um, advantage to using LDA over other sort of previous topic modeling, uh, topic modeling methods like LSA, etc., is number one, that it's a generative model, and number two, it's, um, it allows you to have multiple topics per document, which is actually really helpful for us. So what we do is we've taken this, and, and um, we're very privileged to have Dr. Bly as, as an advisor. And we've worked with him and done a bunch of work ourselves to, to actually adapt this algorithm to our particular case. And essentially what happens is we learn app function using this model. So this is a very bad diagram, but you can imagine that these are apps. And the color of the apps is their dominant topic distribution. And then you can see that the yellow topic has words like sleep and white and noise and ambient and that sort of thing. And you can see that the red topic has words like map and marker and satellite and pin and that sort of thing. And you can kind of get the senses to like, yeah, I know that there's a cluster of apps that are like white noise, relaxation, meditation apps. That makes sense to me. And I know that there are kind of apps that have some navigational type functionality. They have mapping integration. Um, and I know that there are some apps that have kind of voice recognition type functionality in them. And so I could see that an app that's like half blue and half red, that makes sense to me that that would be maybe some mapping application that I could interact with using voice recognition, as an example. Um, and so this, this is really powerful. And what this lets us do is instead of just matching photo editing, does, does the phrase photo editing appear in the document? We can suddenly start to say, how photo editing-like is this document? How many words does this document have that are kind of somehow associated with photo editing? And it really helps us get over these problems that are caused by the lack of data and the, the impoverishedness of the data. So I guess the big question is, does this actually help us? Because what's interesting is that there have been really very, very few studies that... So LDA has been around since 2003. 
And, you know, this is, it's not entirely unknown to the information retrieval community. And there have actually been quite a few studies that have shown that it's actually not particularly helpful for the, for the problem of web search. So does it help for app search? So the key thing to note is that we don't posit LDA as a replacement for TF-IDF, right? There's always going to be value in TF-IDF um, because if you, if you think about it, LDA is like a very high precision feature, right? You, you only model a certain number of topics, you only model a certain amount of information in the corpus. Um, so if you're going to do a really tail query, then that might not be represented in the topic model, right? But what is important is that there are really inter interesting interaction effects. And so neither LDA or TF-IDF, this is a um, random forest L2 norm, neither of them are that great on their own. But when you combine them, they're really, really, really powerful. And what's interesting is LDA, because it's an L2 norm, it kind of prioritizes um, apps that are in the, the top positions. LDA does really, really well on the top couple of positions, but then does really badly for the rest of the, the uh, results. Whereas TF-IDF kind of doesn't do that great up top. It doesn't find the best apps necessarily, but it kind of is more consistent. Um, and it's when you combine them that, that you see a lot of this power. And so um, this is kind of, we're in the process of, we obviously track a whole bunch of search metrics internally that, um, that are uh, kind of confidential and, and we do a bunch of comparisons with competitors and that sort of thing. Um, and I didn't want to put up a big slide saying we're better than Google, but we're better than Google. Um, and uh, better than Apple uh, for iTunes search as well. Um, and we're kind of in the process of writing a paper right now that's going to be a little more, here are our um, standardized results that hopefully will be out sometime next year. Um, but these, these are the results that I could share with you, and they're definitely super, super interesting. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So let me explain what we do here. What we have is we have a query set. Oh. Thank you. You see? All the best intentions. The question was, what are these numbers? So what we do is we take a query set. So we have a whole bunch of users that come to our site each, each month and do queries. So we randomly sample that query traffic, um, and we pull out 500 queries. And then what we do is we do each of those queries. Um, and we, So here we essentially built a search engine with only the TF-IDF signal. We build another search engine with only the LDA signal, and then we build a third search engine that has the two signals combined, right? And then you do each of those 500 queries uh, against each of the three search engines. And you take the top results and then for each query, and then we have an annotator who doesn't see which of the search engines they're coming from, who just goes through and marks each of the apps as either navigational, excellent, um, good, acceptable, off topic, or there's no result. And so there's a score, obviously a negatively uh, decreasing score associated with each of those categorizations. And there's pretty strict goals around, uh, guidelines for how categorization is determined. So for example, if an app can't be excellent unless it has at least, I think it's four stars on the, the market or on the iTunes store. Um, if an app has less than, I think it's three, then it can never be above acceptable. It has to satisfy the query intent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so then what we do is we, so now we have um, 500 and then we have five apps for each one. And so we have, what, that's 2,500 um, ratings. And we do a position weighted metric to combine those. So we say, um, if a bad app is in the first position, that's worse for a user than a bad app being in the fifth position, for example. So we uh, do a position-weighted norm, and then we combine all of those queries together. And this is essentially a score out of one. Um, but it's kind of a little misleading, because you can never actually reach one, right? Because one would be every single, all five apps being navigational for every single query. And a lot of these queries aren't navigational, so can never have a navigational app. 
And a lot of these queries, maybe if they are navigational, there's only one app that satisfies them, right? So if you're looking for Angry Birds Rio, then Angry Birds Rio is a good app, and then maybe there's no more apps that are good apps for that query. Although Angry Birds is a bit of a bad example, but maybe Plants vs. Zombies. You know, there's, you don't want to see other apps that are somehow to do with plants or zombies. You just want Plants vs. Zombies as, as your result there. So um, this... So as some baselines, um, and I'm doing this from memory now, but point 0.4 is if you just randomly picked an app for a query. And I think something like point 0.7 is if we went through and like did it by hand and picked all the best apps we could. Um, that's a, kind of as high as you can get. So that's kind of broadly the range. Um, but either way, that's really like, Fundamentally, it's the percentage increase that's that's important. Yeah. So how do you combine these two signals? So the question was, yay me. Um, how do you combine these two signals? Um, so uh, in actual fact, in Trump's search engine, we obviously use a lot of different signals. Um, these are just two of them. Um, uh, but essentially, at what this means is that we use both for matching. And then at ranking time, we use a combination of the LDA score and the TFIDF score combined to produce the final score, which is then used for ranking. Was there a question over here? Uh, so the question was, do we have some ensemble-based learning um, to actually learn how we weight the features, um, or do we just do it by hand? We have messed around with a few learning to rank algorithms. We've honestly found that right now we get more gains from hand-tuning, um, just because the, the feature set is relatively small. Um, there's, a, there's a story from... Yahoo's, one of Yahoo's learning to rank challenges from a number of years ago when they were so, still doing search. And uh, they did this, this big um, challenge and, you know, there's 500 features and um, how can these be ranked the best? And the model that was hand-picked from the 10 best features kind of combined in a sent, you know, heuristic kind of, oh, I think this is probably a good weight for this feature way was actually within, I, was, I forget the exact number, but it was within reasonable distance of the best gradient descent learning to rank tree with all the 500 features. Um, and that was obviously incredibly important for Yahoo at that stage because they have so many queries and, um, you know, every, it's kind of like Netflix is learning to um, the recommendation challenge, you know, every tiny little percentage increase helps. But for where we're at right now, uh, we just are finding that it's, it's fine for what we're doing right now. Yeah? Uh, please forgive my question again, but I will ask, do you know how many websites in this world which host uh, uh, mobile IPC? How many websites which host mobile IPC? Best my knowledge, I was the host of my company. So yes. Uh, so the first question was, why wouldn't people just use iTunes? How many, how many websites? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so the first, the first question is, where are all these apps coming from? And it's true that most of the apps right now are on Apple, um, are iOS apps. However, the rate of growth of Android apps is about three times the rate of growth of, of uh, Apple apps, iOS apps, which actually kind of makes sense because the rate of growth of users with Android devices, you know, it took longer to catch on, but now it's, it's growing much faster. Um, so I think that that will probably change in the next year. Uh, your second question is, why wouldn't they just go to Apple? Um, so that is obviously the big problem, right? Um, the, 
it's kind of a different problem on Apple than it is on Android. Android, it's actually a somewhat easy problem to answer because there are multiple stores on Android, right? You've got the Android market, but you've also got the Amazon App Store. You've got Vcast on Verizon. You've got a whole bunch of other stores and more st stores that are emerging. And so each of these stores have different prices for apps. They each have exclusive content. And so suddenly it's, it's kind of the kayak price line problem, right? You want to go to one place to find all the apps, and you want to go to one place to find the best price. Um, on iPhone, there's never going to be another app store for iOS native apps than, than the iTunes app store. Um, and, but it, it's still a pretty wide open market. Um, Facebook have recently announced that they're um, really promoting HTML5 apps really, really heavily. Um, and an HTML5 app actually has kind of exist, equal placement on the, on the deck with, uh, with native apps. You can install them to your home screen and click on them like you can any other native app. Um, and in a world where HTML5 apps take off, um, it's the same problem, right? Um, and then fundamentally, you know, people come to Chomp because it's better search. Um, and then your third question was? Yeah, how do we get the data? So, so the question is how how do we access the app information? Um, we so right. So the first the first question I guess is how do you link to an app? Um, and there are. Deep links available. Once you know the app ID, you can then deep link into the Android market. You can deep link into the Vcast app store. You can deep link into the uh, app store on the phone. And, and Apple and Google, they all promote this, right? They want developers. They want people to be able to say, go to this app and download it. This is good for them. Um, in the case of, of the data, Apple actually has an affiliate program. Um, that you can sign up for where you can say, I want your data, and they'll give you a partial database dump of iTunes each night, which is pretty cool. Um, so they just kind of give it to you. It's, it's in their interest for them to promote people who help people find apps. That's, that's good for them. Yeah? No, it's a... Um, it's a generative method. You use variational inference or Gibbs sampling to. Question. Yeah. What was it? Oh, sorry. Thank you. You're keeping me on my toes. I like this. Um, the question was uh, is it a matrix based method? So um, LSA is, um, but we don't have problems with eigenvectors. No. Um, so the question was, how does the query mapping into the topic space work? So I can't go into too much detail around that. Um, there are problems with it, and this is, this is one of the challenges that we've had to overcome. Because the query is so short, it's very, very hard to do topical inference on the query. Um, one, and, and then plus, because the, the document topic space is so different to the query topic space, you get these problems like the maps topic, oh, sorry, the strategy games topic. So apps that tend to have high membership in the topic for strategy games tend to have words like characters, quests, maps, fight, game, win, etc. right? Um, and the problem is that if you just directly map um, a query into this space, then say your query is maps, then you might get a whole bunch of navigational apps back, but you also might get a whole bunch of strategy games ba back. Because the word map is high, has high probability for topic document membership in the topic, but has very low probability for query topic membership, if that makes sense. Um, and so 
we've had to do some kind of cool things to look at how uh, you, looking at click-through corrections and looking at how you can actually determine whether a word is um, useful from a, a query level as opposed to from a document level. But that is one of the things that we've, we've uh, that's one of the things that's not just, you can't just go and pick up a paper in the topic modeling literature and solve it. Uh, so the question was, how many topics? Uh, so this is a very good question. Um, and in fact, one of my, one of my uh, the things that we're looking at is what happens if you don't constrain the number of topics. Because when building uh, a topic model, the number of topics that you can, that you choose is actually has a very great impact on the quality of the topics that you get out. We do to numbers of topics in the thousands. Um, which is very abnormal. Most of the topic modeling literature you know, has 50 or eight. I think the original LDA paper, which did a topic model over all the publications of science, had eight topics. Um, uh, so we have found that, that, which makes sense, right? There are a lot of different kind of app functions. And so we, we model a lot of different topics. But we have also found that once you get high enough, it starts to not matter so much. And you get a lot of noise in between topic modeling runs. Um, so just quickly, where do we go from here? Um, just to, to remind people, I think that search is going to be incredibly important for mobile app users going forward, but also for mobile app developers. And that's something that we're also extremely interested in. And we've just launched a private beta of our search app advertising product. So you can now buy a keyword. And let's say you're building an educational game. You can say, I want to buy the keyword education or kids or something like that and, and display your app as a sponsored result. Um, but from a technical point of view, um, I've just sort of told you all, but um, we haven't 100% solved the query document language problem. Uh, we've, we've come some way with that, but there are still some challenges there. Um, and they're challenges that models like bilingual topic models or labeled LDA don't fully overcome. We've experimented with those, and um, they're, not, they're not as promising as we would have hoped. Um, and so we're looking at a bunch of things. We're looking at things like supervision of the topic model. Um, there are kind of, we know from the app corpus that there are a, a group of to-do lists and there are quite a lot of to-do lists. And we know that there are strategy games. And so given that we know information, particularly information from the query, uh, query stream, we can kind of potentially, we're playing around with using that to seed the topic model. Um, not constraining the number of topics. Um, there are some advances in the field that look at just having um, an infinite number of topics and topics that are added as they need to be, they need to be added. Um, having some potential clustering of queries could be interesting. Yes? Sorry? Uh, so the question was, what exactly is a topic? So in the topic modeling uh, algorithm definition, a topic is a, a distribution over words. So you take all of your words in your vocab and you assign a probability that that word is topical for this topic. And then you also have a distribution over topics for your document. So you might say, so if I go back to this one, let's say this is topic ID one. These are words that have high probability for topic ID one, and that's what defines the topic. Um, and then this app will have a topic membership. So maybe this, I mean, it's not going to be this, but maybe this app has 50% red topic and 50% blue topic. And from that, you can infer, you know, if you multiply the word probabilities by the document probabilities, you can infer kind of the, the word probabilities for an app. Uh, so specifically, the, the topic modeling literature looks at how words co-occur in a corpus um, to capture something interesting. 
It's not a top-down categorization. It's not an ontology. It's not something where um, we've said, oh, we think that there are productivity apps and utility apps, and under utility apps are battery monitors, and under productivity apps are to-do lists, and under battery monitors there are widgets and there are non-widgets, and so on and so forth. Um, it, what it does capture is it, and so it's, it's much less crisply defined than if you asked a user to sit down and say, write me an ontology of all of the apps. We get these kind of topics that maybe are not a function as such, but maybe uh, are a quality of an app, right? So, so a voice recognition may not be, you know, voice recognition, people might not query for voice recognition apps and just get those apps back, but you might find mapping apps that have voice recognition capabilities. It's kind of a, uh, you can think of it as an indication of what words are important for users querying, if that makes sense. I know, it's like magic, right? Uh, the question was, so you just throw a bunch of documents at the algorithm and it works it out. Yes. Um, because all it's looking for is, is statistical co-occurrence. Um, topic modeling has actually been applied to things like image recognition as well. It doesn't necessarily, I mean, it's a bag of words model. It was how it originally designed, but it's not necessarily dependent on words. People have used pixel values and used it to work out whether an image has a building in it or a human being. As an example, yeah. <laughs> so the question was, how do you measure the distance between the query and the document? Um, so uh, the way, so conceptually, a query has a topic membership and a docu document has a topic membership, and then you can kind of measure the distance between those two vectors, essentially. Um, the, the tricky bit is how, so it's, it's relatively easy to work out the topic membership of a document. The tricky bit is how you work out the topic membership for the query. Um, and that's where we, you know, it's not a simple model of just mapping it into the, the topic model. We actually use historical click data and that sort of thing to, to actually infer that, that topic vector. I don't know if that answered your question. So what we can this is, this is a gross oversimplification of what we do, but to kind of help um, elucidate the idea. Um, so let's say the query is one word, right? Let's say the query is photo. And so the query photo exists in a lot of different topics. Um, so we can map into the space and say, okay, um, this word could be, has some probability in this topic and this topic and this topic and this topic and this topic. And this topic. And then we can say, OK, we know previously that the types of apps that users have clicked on, types of results that users have clicked on as a result of um, topic, as, as a result of this query photo, are these apps. And we know the topic distributions of these apps. And so we can kind of use that information to come back to um, what we predict the, query, the topic distribution is for this, this query that is very, very short, very, very little information. And then it's just a matter of comparing the topic distribution for the query and the topic distribution for apps in the corpus, if that makes sense. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, the size of the corpus? There are a million apps at the moment. So the question was, how frequently do we fit the LDA? Uh, how frequently do we fit the model as opposed to doing inference? Um, we've actually found that um, for the types of um, apps that, or the types of functions that emerge from the model, 
that there's not that much variation over time. And so we don't fit it very frequently right now, maybe once every few months. Um, there was a paper by a guy named Matt Hoffman um, who, did, who did his PhD, I don't know, a couple of years ago. Um, and he has this algorithm called online LDA that we've looked at a little bit where essentially the model is continuing to learn as more information comes in. Uh, I think that we will probably want to get to that at some point, um, but at the moment the rate of growth of apps is not great enough that we need to fit the model more frequently. Uh, because it's offline, sorry, the question was, um, do we fit using a single machine or do we use something distributed? Because it's offline, we don't ma it doesn't really matter that it takes a long time, and so um, we fit models just on a single but very powerful machine. Um, again, once the number of apps starts approaching tens or hundreds of millions, then that'll need to change. But again, there is some pretty good advances in distributed LDA as well. So the question was, um, did I mention that we'd chosen some topics and how did we, we choose those? So we actually don't do that right now. I think that the reason I mentioned it is I think it could be something that we do in the future. Um, not for all topics, but just uh, there is quite a lot of, because of the inference process with LDA, there is quite a lot of randomness in the model dependent on kind of how the values are initialized. Um, and so we don't want there to be that randomness. And so to avoid that randomness, we are looking at some things like maybe averaging models over, over a number of runs or maybe seeding models with topics that we know are high quality from previous runs. Um, but we don't do that right now for, for what we have in production. That's all R&D at the moment. So many questions. Uh, you haven't answered one. Oh, it's gone yet. So the question was, if uh, a developer comes out with an app, um, can we tell them how to write their app description? Um, this is a somewhat tricky question. Um, there, there is starting to become more uh, kind of malicious or, or bad SEO techniques used um, by developers. As an example, there's an app on the Android market that the app description consists of the phrase to-do list repeated 1,000 times. Um, we do not currently publish any SEO guidelines. We probably will at some stage in the future because, you know, like Google wants to help people construct good web pages that make them easy to find. We want to help people construct good app descriptions. Um, but we also don't want to be just like Google doesn't want to say, this is how we make page rank so that people can go and, you know, game it. We don't want to be too clear about how we do things either. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you envision consulting with other organizations to help them make their uh, apps fit better into the, you know, a better ontology? Uh, so the question was, do we think we will consult with other people to help um, organizations that already have ontologies? Um, so so the, first, the first answer that I'll give you is browsing hasn't gone away yet, right? Browsing is still important and... and um, we watch what users do. We get users in and say, show me how you found the last app that you found. And a lot of them go to the category list in the app store and click through and browse through. Um, so there still is a place for ontologies. Um, we actually have a, a search API that we partner with people to actually provide search to them. Um, so we're powering search for the new version of the Verizon app store as an example. Um, but and so, yeah, I, I, we're very happy to work together in, in that sense. Um, 
But we believe there will be, a, you know, just like there are lots of places that you find new websites today, you don't just find them all through Google, you find them through your friends on Facebook and you find them on this blog that you read and that sort of thing. We, we think that there will be a lot of different places to find apps. Yeah? Uh, I, the question was how many topics, and I, I was not specific, but I said it was in the thousands. Yeah? Um, can you say something about how long a run takes for a million documents and several thousand topics? And can you also say whether you use something off the shelf, like an app package that does LDA or just something you probably Uh, so the question was, two questions, firstly, how long does a run take, and secondly, um, how do we do it? Um, so a run takes multiple hours, um, not days. Um, it depends on how complex we go and how many topics we set and what parameters we use and that sort of thing, but it's, it would be not less than four and not more than 24. Um, and we... Uh, we use um, a package called Mallet, which is Andrew McCallum's um, from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. His uh, package that is very excellent, it's open source, um, it's fast, it's bug free. We like it. It has a lot of support for all of the newer algorithms as well. Um, so, yeah, I'd recommend it. Mallet, M A L L E T. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I'm glad you know that because I don't know that. So, uh, so my question is, uh, uh, isn't, uh, isn't there a better rather than approach, a innovation approach? Uh, like, for example, mm -hmm. um, uh, isn't it possible to, uh, if you don't have hyperlinks, if you don't, to invest them? <laughs> so the, the question was, is there a better method um, then topic modeling, maybe inventing hyperlinks. So that would be good. If you want to go and do a startup and invent some hyperlinks for apps, I, am, I will back you all the way. Um, uh, the, the particular example you gave of, of the Napoleon sentence, uh, I want to be clear that I'm not necessarily representing that this technique will work well for any other type of search beyond app search. Um, I think it hypothetically could, um, particularly for things like product search or um, maybe potentially music search, I don't know. But there, I think that there could be other applications. But one thing that I don't think it will work particularly well for is, is information search. Um, what it does do is it, um, that reduction in dimensionality that you mentioned, that's a useful reduction of dimensionality because what it does is it, the way that we have tuned the algorithm is it reduces the dimension, reduces uh, or it flattens the model down to get rid of all of the, oh, if you have a bug, send an email to the developer here. And we ignore that mention of the word email because it's not topical. Um, but in the Gmail app, we, li you know, we pay attention to the mention of the word email because it's surrounded by words like reply and compose and message. Um, and so, uh, again, I want to stress, this is not meant to be a TF-IDF replacement. If you were to just build a search engine using an LDA signal, 
you would get very bad results for tail queries. Um, what it does do is for head and trunk queries is it helps us increase the, the accuracy of those queries. It, it gives us more information. Um, so uh, the query email is a great example. Um, when we first got going with this problem, I built a TFIDF search engine because I thought it would be a really simple solution and I was very naive and was just like, oh yeah, we'll just build a search engine and it'll only take a week. And, um, and the query email was one of the most atrocious queries because there were games that would have in their description text, email the developer for, you know, if you have suggestions and email the developer if you find any bugs and email the developer for a free upgrade and blah, 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 blah. And from a TFIDF perspective, these apps looked like really great email apps, but the Gmail app had the word email once and so did not look like a good email app at all. And this is when we really started to realize the problems um, that, that TF, TFIDF just doesn't work. Um, so, the, so the question was, can I give an example of, of where these numbers came from? Um, this particular slide I actually did a couple of months ago and I don't remember where those numbers came from. But um, broadly, um, I, I would encourage you to, to grab Mallet and just shove some data into it and see what comes out because it, it actually is somewhat intuitive once you actually start playing with it. But essentially what we do is we take, so each of these apps is represented by a document. Um, let's say we picked three topics. We would put all of these documents into the, the topic modeling algorithm. What would come out would be topic one, voice, X percent, speech, Y percent, blah, 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 blah. And it would continue down. These would just be the high probability words. It would continue down for every word in the vocab, right? and so on and so forth for two. And then this app would be 80% yellow and maybe, or 88% yellow and 2% blue and 10% red. And this one would be, have also have a distribution over topics. And those are the kind of two pieces of data that you come out with. So you can then, you then have a topic space which you can index. I don't know if that answered your question, but. That's the plate notation. Sorry? Yeah, so this is, this is um, I would refer you to this paper. Um, and actually, if you go on videolectures.net, Dr. Bly does an amazing, if you search for LDA, he does a really great talk explaining what LDA is. Um, and he'll do a much better job than I am capable of. Um, so uh, I would highly encourage you to go and watch that. Uh, so the question is, have we thought about from a UI perspective, maybe instead of just showing a list of results, um, you know, having some map that users can kind of travel through? It's actually a really interesting question. Um, 10 blue links does not work for app search whatsoever. And so we've done quite a lot of um, iteration and testing around our user experience. And we have this user experience that's very focused on kind of product merchandising. So we have kind of big screenshots and big icons and reviews and that sort of thing. Um, the, the actual kind of flying through the topic space model might be a little um, not intuitive for a lot of people, but what we do do is to solve that problem I mentioned earlier when users type in photo and you don't know what they mean, we use our topic space to actually suggest queries to users. So uh, when you do the query photo on Chomp, we actually provide you with a little bar that says, um, you know, photo editing, 
photo photography, cameras, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can click on that with one click to then do that query. And we find that that is incredibly successful in converting users from doing this really unintentioned query to actually opening up this, this actual intention. Um, and that's how we kind of not surface the topic model to users, but help users kind of navigate through that space. Uh, so the question was, um, explainability of a topic model is a problem. Um, and there have been several papers on this. Um, and do we kind of go through and hand label topics? Um, we do go through and hand label topics, but we don't show those to users. We just use that for internal use. It, it's helpful for us when we're looking at a topic membership to be able to look at some internal note that we have about, oh, this is something to do with to-do lists. Um, the, the, the great thing about how we use, so there have been kind of these few academic um, search engines that are based off LDA previously. The thing that I think really works for us is that we hide all notions of the topic model from the user. From the user's point of view, this is just magic that knows that when you search for photo editing that Photoshop is the right answer, right? Um, uh, having said that, when we get it wrong, it is a little bit problematic. Um, and with search, you always get a bunch right, and then you get a little bit wrong. Um, we're looking at how we can provide kind of intelligent snippets that help users kind of understand a little bit more why the, the apps are being shown for the query. That's, that's something that we're working on right now, which we're really excited about. So yeah, um, behind you. Uh, so the two questions, the first was, is there a way to say I only want apps that I don't have on my phone? Um, and the second was, is there a way, do we kind of take into account newness or freshness of the results? Um, so in answer to the second one, because it's a little bit simpler, um, yes, we, we take into account things like um, freshness of, of the app, things like how long ago the app was rated, if, if maybe Tap Tap Revenge 2.6, which used to be popular two years ago, has not had many reviews lately, but Tap Tap Revenge 4 has, then we, we pay attention to that sort of information. Um, there's definitely a lot of things that we do to try and make the results as fresh as possible. Um, with respect to the getting information about what apps you have installed, we can do that on Android, but it's actually technically not possible to get an authoritative list of apps that you have installed on iPhone. There are kind of some hacky things you can do. You can look at what processes are running and use some URL intents and kind of get a partial list, but um, it's just not possible right now. Um, you can use the sale keyword. So if you write sale photography as a query, then we'll actually just give you photography apps that are on sale, which is kind of cool. Um, but, uh, and we're actually thinking about doing the same thing for the key keyword new. So new photography would just give you kind of the newer apps that are, are photography apps. Um, but the actual kind of personalizing search results is just really hard on iPhone. On, on Android, if you do a search for photography and you already, uh, photo editing and you already have Adobe Photoshop, we'll actually say open instead of go and download this. So you can kind of use it for nav navigational searches as well. Uh, did you have a query? Uh, so the question was, what happens when a conceptually totally new type of app comes in? Um, so that's why we update the topic model um, every so often. 
Uh, and that's why we have, um, so we do do inference as apps come in, but that doesn't help you if suddenly there's this whole new class of apps that's like magic transportation, teleportation apps, right? Um, which would be cool. Um, uh, that's why we have to update the topic model somewhat frequently. We find that that doesn't, like an earth shattering new class of apps doesn't happen that frequently, um, but we do update the topic model every so often. Uh, more in matching than in ranking, but we do, sorry, the question was, thank you. <laughs> the question was, do we uh, use ODA for both matching and ranking um, or just in one or the other? We use it for both, but it is much more important at the matching stage. Um, but yeah, we do use it for both. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, what does somehow cluster queries mean? Um, there's kind of this intuition that if I type in photo editing or edit photos or um, modify photos, that really I want to see the same result set, right? Or if I type in discount and discounts or coupons, like eh, kind of the same result set, right? And um, and so West, uh, right now, our model doesn't capture that. Our model treats every query as being totally orthogonal to every other query, and that's just not true. Um, it would be kind of interesting to look at, and we're starting to look at this a little bit, how queries kind of are similar and how we can use then information about one query that's in a cluster to infer information about the other query that's maybe less common or to be able to take a totally new query and see how it maps into that clustered space and, and work out then how we should handle it. But it's all very R&D right now. Did you? Uh, so the question was, do we consider the user's past search behavior? We do it at aggregate level. I actually, at the moment, don't believe that personalizing queries is that great an experience. If I did a query for photo editing and saw totally different results to you doing a query for photo editing, um, because users kind of have this expectation of predictability from, this, from search, um, I don't know whether you guys ever do this, but I've definitely said to people, do a query for blah on Google and it's the third result, right? And being Australian, this is incredibly problematic when I tell an Australian person to do this you know, back home in Australia because we have these different search results and I don't like that. Um, so maybe present, we, we've, we'll probably go down the path of maybe presenting personalized information as a layer on top of search results. So for example, you know, if, if you query for photo editing and one of your friends has rated Photoshop, then, you know, maybe we'll show that to you, but maybe we won't show that to me if they're not my friend. Um, but in terms of actually fundamentally changing the search results. Um, So, so the question was, um, surely this solution is general for things like product catalog, product catalog searches and search for short tweets, search and short documents. So while I believe hypothetically that that may be true, I make absolutely no representation that that is in fact true. Um, 
the there's, there's a multitude of different kind of elements to this app search problem. One is this fundamental difference between the query language and the document language. Um, another is this kind of more semantic type query, which is the product catalog search um, problem. Um, uh, you know, the short document problem is, is similar. We have really exclusively focused on app search and we've kind of very blinkers on and focused and uh, I, I am sure that many of the ideas could be generalized to, for example, searching tweets. Um, but I make no representations of that fact. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the question is, are we just searching over some metadata or are we actually prying the app open? No, so that's one of the big problems. That's one of the challenges that we need to overcome is that we can't pry the app open um, or it would take an astronomical amount of hacking that probably the app developers wouldn't necessarily like to be able to pry the app open. So what we do is we search over um, kind of this app document, which is the app name and the app description and... Um, uh, the category name and the developer name and some other pieces of information. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, and it's actually arguable whether opening the app up and searching the contents of the app would be helpful. I mean, if you think about it, right? So social networking, the query social networking. So I think everyone can agree that returning Facebook as the first result for social networking is probably a pretty good result, LinkedIn. right? LinkedIn should be first, and then social no and Facebook should be second. Um, and um, very good. And uh, so if you open up LinkedIn, right, you're going to get a whole bunch of data about, oh, here is this person, and here is this person, and here is their work history, and blah, 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 blah. That's not necessarily going to help you work out that it's a social networking app. Um, you know, it's the same problem as, as the Kathy's blog problem or the Facebook problem, right? Seeing me write a whole bunch of articles about what I've done today may not necessarily w help you work out that it's anything to do with Kathy Edwards, particularly if I don't use my name in all of those documents. So the, to, to a certain extent, I think that the, and I think that's, that's, um, that's validated by this data, right? That you actually do get a lot of the information that it's possible to get from the app descriptions, which is these blue bars. Um, when you start adding incremental data sources, it doesn't radically change the game. Um, so the question was, but surely that if you look at at least the navigation within the app, so the names on the tabs or something, hypothetically, yes. Um, uh, I, uh, when you're thinking about building a great search engine, you, you kind of have two ways of making your search engine better. You can be more intelligent about using the data that you've got, or you can go and find more data to put into it. Um, we've definitely taken the approach initially of, of looking at how you be really smart with the data that you've got, as opposed to looking at how we can radically increase the amount of data we have available to us, because uh, that's where we think we'll get the most bang for buck. Um, but definitely like that reaches, you know, you kind of start getting less and less headroom over time. Um, and I can definitely s see a world where in time we start to look at things like that. Particularly if you, you know, if you start looking at HTML5 apps, that starts looking very interesting indeed. Or 
So the question is, is the problem just going to be solved by market consolidation? Um, so SourceForge is one example of where there are a lot of dead uh, apps. I would argue that the internet is a counterexample. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, every day there's a new startup that does something that probably other people have done before. Um, and we, we already know that we get a lot of queries that are not just, like we don't just get alarm clock over and over and over and over again. We get alarm clock with own music, or we get alarm clock heavy sleeper, or we get, you know, and I think that the interesting thing about if you look at um, an app searcher versus a web searcher, a web searcher will typically put in a query like, as an example, when did Napoleon die, right? Um, or this bug, what does this mean? Um, and they'll scan through the top 10 results and they'll just click on the first one that gives them the information that they want, right? An app searcher doesn't do that. An app searcher, if you type in alarm clock and the first result is a good alarm clock, they won't stop there. They'll keep flicking through and they'll want to compare and contrast a few different alarm clocks and they might download one or two or three and try them out. They might look at the screenshots of a few different ones to really try and, because they're making a purchasing decision, even if it's free, they're making a purchasing decision, which is very, very different to kind of the web search world. And so I personally have great faith in the developers of this world to create really interesting, unique, new and novel apps that have functionality, maybe not for everyone, but maybe for some you, you know, small niche of people. And I think that that's the sort of problem that is wide ranging enough to not just be solved by consolidation. Uh, so the question was, can people pay to get higher rankings? Um, no, but we do have, just like Google has, we have a sponsored search uh, program. So you can buy a keyword and appear as a sponsored result. Um, but we very clearly demarcate the sponsored results from the non-sponsored results. And we don't you know, just show you 10 sponsored results. We only show you one and then um, a bunch of natural results. So yeah, it's a pretty, I mean, it's, it's not, a rocket science model, right? Like it's been done before. Sure. Yeah, so uh, the question was, surely matching and ranking are different problems, and maybe LDA doesn't help you too much at ranking time. You know, you know maybe you need things like click-through rate and that sort of thing. Definitely. Um, I've only really talked about one little facet of what Chomp's search engine does um, in this talk, but we do a whole bunch of other stuff to work out things like the authority of an app, whether it's an adult app or whether it's a porn app or whether it's not, whether it's a widget, whether it's not, whether it's been clicked on before for this query, whether it's not, whether it hasn't been. Um, so there's a lot of other signals that we use, including some authority signals um, that look at things like freshness and price and that sort of thing, you know, language identification to really work out what the best results are at ranking time. We do have, uh, you know, not a, not a Google number of signals, but we do have a large number of signals that we combine at ranking time to make those decisions. Uh, the question was, what are the possible user feedback signals? So um, 
there are explicit user feedback. You know, users can actually come in and rate an app. Um, but there's also a lot of implicit user feedback, which is pretty standard stuff. It's the same stuff that Netflix uses. It's the same stuff that Google uses. Do, did a user click on it? Did the user look at the screenshots of the app? Did the, what did the user do as a result of, of that query? Uh, so we, the random forest is just something we use to evaluate. Um, it's, where is that slide? Uh, so this is, it's not used at ranking time. It's um, just, we've just started looking at how we can actually start communicating this to the academic community. And so this is a, standard technique that they like to see to um, evaluate different methodologies. Okay. Oh, yeah? Uh, the question is, are there hierarchical topics? Um, there are models, LDA models, that have been modified to be hierarchical. Um, we don't use them right now, um, which doesn't, uh, doesn't make any, but, uh, the model that we do use doesn't make any representations that topics aren't subtopics of each other. It just looks at what happens statistically, how words statistically co-occur. Um, but you should play around with it. it. You'll get a feel of it pretty quickly. Okay, I think I've kept you away too long. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>